everyone. This is episode two of Cup of Chats and it's a very, very special one. This is Stephanie. Hello. Stephanie is from the Sleepyhead Clinic in Exeter, but Stephanie's services are available worldwide, so I shall leave all of her details in the description. She's extremely knowledgeable and experienced, so I'm really excited to be presenting her to you. Wow, that was so professional. (laughs) It was. We're in a really cool place, actually. We are in the BBC headquarters. It's a really historical building. I feel quite bizarre being here. It's a really odd place. We're in one of their green rooms. Yeah. Which isn't green. It's not green. Well, the sofa's green. Yeah. It's quite a nice green, actually. Yeah. Yeah. This is the Victoria Derbyshire show green room. Stephanie's just been interviewed on there. So Mm -hmm. shall we get into our questions? Yeah. Okay. So the first question I have for you is, um, how did you become a sleep specialist? And I know you have a different name for it. Mine's a simplified version. What's your... Oh, that's fine. That's what everyone calls me. Um, I'm a sleep physiologist. There we go. So we diagnose and treat sleep disorders. Yeah but I specialise more in insomnia these days. Okay. After doing them all, I Mm -hmm. think it's the most interesting one and it's also the most common problem that we have. I think everyone, all of us have suffered with some sort of sleep insomnia type symptom before. Yeah. How did I get into it? That's a big question. Uh, I started with a degree in psychology. Yeah. I um, did a placement year at Harvard Medical School. I was very lucky that that was set up by the university. Don't know how I did it. Got it. I do. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, when I was there, did lots of sleep research at the, the medical school sleep division. And we even did things where we looked at um, sort of a 25-hour Mars day mm. for the astronauts of NASA. Yeah, that's so uh, interesting when yeah. you told me that. Yeah, it's really amazing. interesting. What an amazing opportunity. It really was. Um, so I came home sort of with all this knowledge, yeah. thinking, well, this is what a psychologist does, looking at sleep, or it's not historically. Um, and so I came back and I, I found I had all the skills to be a sleep physiologist. Okay. So I went to Guys and St. Thomas's in London, here yeah. in London, um, and I was taught by some amazing sleep specialists in the country. I was very mm. lucky, and they're all mm. my close friends now. They're mm. lovely. Um, and we, uh, we, we were lucky, we, we were running a sleep service which was one of the biggest in the country, mm-hmm. um, all different types of disorders and then I was looking at clinically treating people rather than just looking at how interesting sleep was, it was actually people with problems yeah. that needed our help. Yeah. But what I noticed was um, that with all of our skills we weren't really offering the basics. Mm-hmm. Why can't I get to sleep? Mm. What happens if I wake up in the night? Mm. Why is this a perpetual problem? Mm. Um, it was all the more complex problems, which are less common, actually. Yeah, really interesting to research. Mm. Um, and I'm sure that it'd be great to do a study on someone with um, really serious conditions. Mm. There are so many more, more people, like you say, yeah. with insomnia. Yeah, So, and there's lots of research in insomnia right now. It has become a bit of a buzz topic, okay. which is a good thing. Um, but back then, I didn't know what to do, so I did a master's in behavioural sleep medicine, which really taught me that there was lots we could do about insomnia that wasn't drugs. Right. And I was really like, why aren't we doing this in mm. the NHS right now? Mm. Um, so I left, I went down to Devon, mm-hmm. I became part of a small NHS service down there, um, and I started my own business called Sleepyhead Clinic. And actually, since I've started it, the NHS are now starting to get around this idea of yeah. treating insomnia without the use of drugs yeah. or at least trying the behavioural techniques first. Yeah. Maybe you're just showing them how it's done in order for them to... I think, yeah, I mean... I'm, I, it, the only way to prove how something works is by doing it, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. And you're doing um, it. Absolutely, and we did have a big evidence base for it in research, but you're right, sometimes people just need to see it being done Mm. in the local area, Mm. how many people are suffering for it, and and how successful that is, Mm. to really see whether we should take it on. So I actually do work on on a sort of a consultancy basis for the NHS now, which Mm -hmm. is great. 
Um, and then I spend the rest of my time trying to find ways to disseminate knowledge, so making it easier for people to understand this complex sleep knowledge in a way that they can take home and actually do something about it. Yeah. Um, I think it's great that sleep has become this amazing topic and we're all very excited about it in the mm. media. Mm. Um, the problem is that we are just saying, if you don't sleep well, you're going to die. Yeah. Or the equivalent of, well, that's what people hear. Mm. And then we give them lots of sleep trackers. Mm. And both of those things, I believe, are actually helping to scaremonger the public into sleeping more poorly than they are now. Yeah, you should. You have to do this before bed. And if you don't do this before bed, or if you don't get this many hours, yeah. or you don't go to bed at this time, exactly. you're in so much trouble. Exactly. So we're actually now all sort of, you know, we've got these strict rules about everything we should do, but nobody's sleeping better. Yeah. So, so it's about trying to find the actual evidence-based ways yeah. and disseminate them in a way that would be helpful. And, of course, then I came across you and everything you were doing as well. Yes, but and first, before, yeah. you have to tell us about the programme that you've been on. Uh, Don't okay. skip that part. <laughs> She's been on TV quite a lot. Uh, I did a programme of Channel 4 last year um, called The Secrets of Sleep. Yeah. It's still available on Catch Up, I think can't get rid of it <laughs> um, and it was a really good mini series um, and me and a bunch of sleep specialists um, we took about 12 contributors so 12 people with really bad sleep problems that had already been tried to be fixed in the mm. NHS and things like that mm. and we basically delivered them the most up-to-date evidence-based approaches a lot of it was behavioral sleep medicine work which is what I do in my clinic yeah and we managed to resolve a lot of their problems. It was amazing. I, re I found it really, really interesting. Yeah, I think I think I was so, and the and the patients that we had, they were so lovely, and you could really tell how awful it was to have these problems in their lives. And bringing that to the forefront, bringing that to the public, and helping them understand mm. this is actually really serious, mm. um, and it's not funny. Um, because people obviously make jokes about people that have abnormal behaviour at night, for example, mm. and don't realise there are some very simple ways that we can try and resolve that. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's about getting it out there, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. You're doing a good job of it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and now I'd like to know how you discovered ASMR. What was your initial reaction and or initial feeling about it? No pun intended. <laughs> That was a good joke. It was a good joke. <laughs> <laughs> and and how did you come to the conclusion that this was something that could be a valid, maybe technique, or at least a thing? Yes. Okay. So I guess it was a few years ago when I was just looking for relaxation audio things online, because relaxation has existed for a long time in, mm. in various different ways you know imagery techniques where you say to people imagine you're on a beach or imagine you're in a mm -hmm. forest mm -hmm. which we might be doing in another video that we mm. have together um, and then you've got things like trying to relax the muscles muscular progressive muscular relaxation mm -hmm. so I was looking for different um, audios of this on YouTube even though it's video I was looking for the yeah. audio is important yeah. that's how I found it I was yeah. looking for nature sounds yeah that's it nature nature sounds and for me it's rain on a tent and nice. then I'm going to fall asleep very easily. Um, so I, I started to notice these videos come up and at first because it was quite early on in the ASMR game um, they weren't called ASMR but they were sort of Whisper. in that kind of ilk. Yeah so that's a long time ago. Yeah and then I just found them really relaxing. Yeah. I just I, for myself I don't I know people describe it as tingles in their head, but all for me, I just feel really relaxed. Mm -hmm. And um, my partner at the time, he also used it while he was designing things mm -hmm. um, for work, so he would listen to it while he was doing it, and it was really interesting. And I sort of said to a few people around me, including a, a colleague of mine who's, who's very senior in sleep medicine, and yeah. I sort of said, have you heard of this? And she was like, yeah, I use it. <laughs> So it's just incredible. Yeah. I just find that fascinating. So I think it's really important to try to define it here. So I know that people, some people think, are you saying that this is how people should fall asleep? Mm. And really what I'm saying is that it is a tool mm. to help you feel less anxious, yeah. to feel safe, yeah. um, and to relax. Yeah. I know that everyone out there at the moment, they're trying to use relaxation as a tool to sleep, and it is a tool. Yeah. But you always need that drive to sleep. Yeah. So the only thing that can make us sleepy 
is enough wake time, enough time being awake, quality wake time will help you to feel sleepy. That's mm. the only thing. Mm. So you just need that drive. It's a bit like a hunger drive. We eat when we get really hungry. Yeah. I know sometimes we eat for other reasons, but yeah. most of the time it's a drive state and you eat because you're really, really hungry. It's the same with sleep. We sleep because we're really, really sleepy. Yeah. And that's why sometimes relaxation doesn't work mm. because you're not quite there yet. Mm. And sometimes it does. Yeah. But the beauty of this is to use it if somebody's really anxious, for example, there's yeah. no point me starting sleep treatment on a very anxious person. Yeah. I need to reduce the anxiety first yeah. because anything I do to them is potentially going to make them more anxious. Mm. Um, and if this is the kind of thing that can help people feel calm and relaxed, mm. then so be it. It's just another another technique in all these relaxation techniques mm. so that we should be able to mm. use. Yeah, that's the way I see it. I see it as um, one of many ways. Yeah to relax whilst there are so many uses for it Mm. and you can talk all day about all the different uses but there are so many different things that you can choose from and they work for some people and they don't work for others Mm. it's just another one of those things exactly um i would always suggest before going to bed try not to use one that's too long maybe but at the same time and that's because it might um, interfere with the quality of the sleep if you accidentally fall asleep with it on But at the same time, if your anxiety is really high, yeah. telling somebody that they can't do the thing that is making their anxiety go away yeah. is counterproductive. Mm. And until that anxiety is firmly fixed, mm. you know, actually, if that's going to help people, then so be it. Mm. That is great. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, where do you see your future in your career? my gosh I don't know I feel like uh, when I started the service the business I just was, wanted to treat anyone off the street who had a sleep problem yeah. and I just wanted them to have access to treatment and so I guess now I've achieved that I've started to come across a lot of people that wanted my help with training for other medical professionals so mm. now I do that mm. um, a lot of corporate clients want people to go into businesses which I like to do every now and again mm. um, I really love helping people, so it's always going to be something where I can use that. Mm. Um, But I think now I'm really interested. I think the future is helping to change this mindset in business that you can sleep when you're dead. That actually the person who stays at work latest is doing the most work. And, you know, this martyrdom thing Mm. about... It's very British as well, isn't it? Yeah. But it's actually across the world. It really is. Um, and so if there's any way I can help with that, is there, if there's any way I can change legislation, mm. um, help to really change that mindset overall, mm. if I can reach more people, mm. um, then that is, I think I'd be very happy with that. I don't know how. I just mm. keep plodding along and these things keep coming along. So yeah. we'll see. Fantastic. So... What I'd like to know is if any of the viewers would like to get in touch with you and inquire about what it is that you do, how do you go about helping people? What's the first step? Okay. And um, what kind of programme do you take people on? Okay. So, um, first of all, I see people in my clinic, but I mostly see people online now. So it's a lot of Skype sessions, which is great because we have international clients now and lots of people. We've got a mum of three versus a retired gentleman versus a big CEO of a massive company. So Mm -hmm. unfortunately, insomnia doesn't discriminate. So all sorts of different people. And when they come to me, they have four initial sessions. And four sessions, I think, is all you need over a bit of time, as well as my Mm -hmm. support along the way. Mm So treating insomnia isn't, there's no just sudden, a sudden fix. There's no, nothing I could just suddenly tell you and then suddenly the world falls into place. I wish that was the case. Yeah. But there are components to it. So we know that the original problem that you may have had that caused it, if you indeed know what that was, yeah. it can't be the thing that's keeping it going. Because if that happened to you 20 years ago mm-hmm. and it's happened to other people that don't have that problem why do you still have it now Mm -hmm. so there has to be some other what we call perpetuating factors Mm -hmm. and usually when we look at people's behavior it's often in their behavior Mm -hmm. that they um, find these perpetuating factors 
And that is unfortunately perpetuated by the media. So when you hear, you know, gosh, if you don't sleep well, that's not good. Insomniacs are like, gosh, well, I don't sleep well anyway. Mm. How am I going to improve this? And they sort of further want to change their behaviour any way they can. They'll look up all this research, eat more kiwis, um, don't drink coffee before bed, have a warm bath, have some hot milk. And they suddenly start changing all their behaviour. They start giving in to sleepiness whenever it comes along so they know they can't sleep at the same time all the time so they just give in whenever it happens Mm -hmm. which is rare but it might be really early or late in the morning Um, you know their timings of their sleep or or the opportunity for their sleep is all is all wrong Um, and you know this idea that they need to go to bed early to sleep well just the idea of going to bed early isn't going to suddenly make you sleep Mm. um so we have to sort of re-educate people on why why are they doing those behaviors that's linked to your beliefs what you believe well i believe if i go to bed early and lie in a dark room sleep will come Mm. and even though you believe that you've got all this experience telling you that that's not that's not real and so it's it's about changing that mindset and helping people to understand insomnia isn't sleep deprivation for example if we had chronic sleep deprivation like all the research studies show it's very bad for us then, then we'd just give you a bed and you'd fall asleep because your sleep de- deprivation is restricting yourself, actively restricting yourself from sleep. Yeah. Insomniacs aren't doing that. They are um, they're doing everything they can to try to sleep. Yeah. So it's about trying to change their mindset that actually what they've got is not sleep deprivation. They don't need to be frightened, mm-hmm. but we do need to fix it mm-hmm. because insomnia is very powerful. Your brain is under no impressions that you need to change, otherwise it would be giving you a lot more uncomfortable feelings. Sure. But actually you're coping, you're going yeah. through your day, you're still doing everything that you did before. Yeah. So we've got to try and find a way to change that. Mm-hmm. So it starts with your beliefs and your mindset. Then we look at your behaviours, and then we look at sleep diaries. So I get people to do a sleep diary, and and we go through something called sleep scheduling therapy, mm. um, and that is where we try to actually shift the timings of their sleep mm. according to their personalised sleep diary. So I can't mm. really tell you how to do it without having a sleep diary from you and yeah, that's and showing it. Yeah, you. it's all individual. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, it's all individual. Um, and then, of course, we do need to look at relaxation. So we do need to we do need to look at reducing anxiety, and that's when I would give them lots of different techniques that we know have been helpful. Mm. I also tell them about ASMR because mm. if I have a, especially particularly anxious people, mm. I need them to feel safe and calm and relaxed. Mm. And if they can find that online, mm. perfect. I love that word, safe. Yeah, it's so nice. Well, it's true. Yeah, that's what it, it does. What I believe it does. It is. Um, so, so we go into that um, and, and then we, we sort of finish it all off by trying to make sure that person really understands those techniques. We really are teaching people to be sleep experts. So what we do goes beyond sleep hygiene, which some of your viewers may have heard of, which is all these very strict rules about what you shouldn't, shouldn't do. Yeah. In fact, we sort of take those away and help people to relax a lot more mm. about it, mm-hmm. giving them the techniques that we know will work and sort of, sort of saying, you know, take the responsibility of yourself. Yeah. You're going to follow this and then you're just going to get on with your day. Yeah. There's no strict sort of, you've got to have a warm bath at a certain yeah. time. Yeah. That doesn't work and your viewers who have got insomnia will know that doesn't work because they've been doing it for yeah. years and years and years. Yeah. I love your working. approach when you talk about, um, look, if 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 you're not falling asleep in your room leave the room and go and watch your favorite program yeah. now for me before i before you said that i would have thought well, no you shouldn't go and watch yeah. a screen exactly that's even worse but the problem is you've already got a problem there there's mm. a problem there and and the point is you need to feel content and happy and if there's sleepiness there if you really are sleepy but it's just anxious and stress that's stopping you then you've got to go and distract yourself yeah so you know, a little bit of extra light exposure isn't going to isn't going to cause a big problem. And after all, course, you're doing something that you really love. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. yeah, you're feeling content. You're feeling happy, and that's the most important thing. It's quality time for you. Yeah. Um, whereas if I tell someone to go away and clean the bathroom, for example, well, mm. that's not quality time, and that mm. could probably stress them out. And actually, I've heard of other specialists tell patients that not sleep specialists, but people like. Um, in other fields that are trying to take on sleep as something that they can fix without yeah. an evidence base yeah. um, and they're telling people these awful things and it's increasing their anxiety mm. and making them mm. more stressed and you hear those things um, on TV yeah oh, yeah. but TV it's not the you know it's not it's not always accurate 
Um, so yeah, so there's a so what we do is very multi-component. There's lots of parts of it, mm. and part of it is just having a sleep specialist that you can ask any sleep question to, and they're going to know the answer, mm. or at least they're the, they're they're, they're going to know it better than most people when it comes to sleep. Yeah, and that gives you reassurance and support and motivation because it's hard, like any habit, like kicking a caffeine habit or weight loss or you know, trying to stop smoking, if you don't have support in place, mm. you only have yourself, and we're only human, Yeah. you know, sometimes we all need a bit of support, Yeah. so I think sometimes, often I think that my, my clients are very strong people, and that they could do it on their own, but they just need yeah. further support. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. My pleasure. That was really, really interesting, I love talking to you. <laughs> talking to you. And I'm so grateful that you are interested in ASMR and you, it's so nice to have this backup from someone in your profession. I'm really, really proud of it. Thank you so much. That's all right. Thank you. Stephanie is on her website, um, but you can also look on her social media because she has tons of free advice on there, which she posts regularly, mm -hmm. as I've seen. Instagram stories, uh, Twitter, hints and tips. So I'll leave all the links in the description of this video so you can follow her and uh, get some information and use it alongside of your ASMR. Thank you. Thank you. And that's been Copper Chats at the BBC building in London, of all places. <laughs> <laughs>